So uh, I'm going to talk about a single paper. Uh, it's joint work with uh, John Fernley, who's a postdoc uh, at Liverpool, which is where I am. And uh, it's about the simplex method for linear programming. So um, quite a lot of technical details will just be omitted. My goal is to just give you a high level uh, overview of the whole result uh, with some motivation and background along the way. So just so we're on the same page, just a simple example of a linear program and reminding people what the simplex method is. So we have uh, a bunch of uh, linear inequalities that are going to define a feasible region. So we have uh, here in dimension two, sorry for the toy example, it was just easier for me. So we have uh, two variables, x1 and x2, they're both non-negative, and we have three linear inequalities. That defines our feasible region here, and we're maximizing a linear function over that feasible region, in this case giving us a unique optimum solution that we would like to find. The input for the simplex method for us is going to be a linear program like this and a starting vertex of the feasible region. Okay? So a vertex we represent within the simplex method as a basic feasible solution. I'm going to go into a bit more detail on that shortly. In this view where we have inequalities describing the feasible region, we should think of this uh, a vertex as corresponding to a feasible basis where the basis is dimension many linearly independent constraints picked from our set of uh, inequalities. Okay, and we get this vertex by taking those constraints and making them tight binding. So what's a pivot step? Well, it's simply walking along an edge of this polyhedron so as to improve the objective function. Okay, so in every step, we're improving the objective function value, and we implement this by one variable entering the basis and one variable leaving it. Okay, so in general, this uh, example is too small to demonstrate, but there can be multiple choices of entering variable. There can also, due to degeneracies, be multiple choices of leaving variable as well. And uh, we make our choices of exactly which ones to pick for both of these according to some pivot rule. Here are three pivot rules. We're going to be focusing on one of them, but just to give you an, uh, a broader picture. So largest coefficient essentially says, so remember we're always picking a variable to enter the basis so that we improve the objective function. Largest coefficient says pick an entering variable that maximizes the improvement per unit increase of the entering variable. So if that doesn't quite make sense, don't worry. This is the pivot rule we're going to concentrate on for the whole talk, so we'll be going into more detail on that. Uh, the other two are, 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 are simpler in a, in a sense to understand, uh, harder to actually implement. Largest increase just says, pick the entering variable that results in the largest possible increase in the objective function value. The one that's actually most used in practice, the one that tends to perform best on practical problems is steepest edge, which says, look at the direction defined by the objective function value, and now pick the edge that is closest to that direction. Okay? The simplex method, and in particular Danzig's pivot rule, are best understood in the equational form of a linear program but that's not so good for pictures, so now we're going to move to the equational form. You can think of going from the inequality form to the equational form by adding slack variables, and so now you should think of having many variables in the following setup. So we now have uh, equation AX equals B, where, um, where we have many columns in A compared to the number of rows. And now for us, a basis is going to be a selection of these columns so that we have the same number of columns as we have rows. <coughs> and we get uh, now, and essentially given such a basis, we essentially are going to try and uh, solve for uh, se uh, those variables in the basis as being positive or uh, possibly non-negative, but in a non-degenerate setting, positive and we set all the non-basic ones to zero. Okay, and this is also feasible if... Um, okay, so I said that the wrong way around. So what we're going to do first is we're going to set the non-basic ones to zero. If these things are linear independent, we simply solve... We can uh, this inverse is well-defined. We simply compute 
xb according to this equation. If this thing's non-negative, then it's feasible. There are uh, potentially uh, pivoting rules that might even consider non-feasible things, but that's not what we're doing today. We might come back to that later. We have a natural dual linear program associated with the primal. I'm not going to go into the details of duality, but for us, the main thing that I want to take from these slides is um, Dancing's pivot rule can be thought of in terms of the dual constraints here. We're going to be doing something with Markov decision processes, an algorithm called policy iteration, and the pivot rule in the Markov decision process we're going to look at is going to basically correspond directly to Danzig's pivot rule. We're going to have a Markov decision process. We're going to write down linear programs, and the linear programs we're going to write down are going to be exactly in this form. You don't need to really kind of memorize the form except to be able to pattern match the two that these two forms are exactly the same. Okay, so as well as defining uh, a, a basic uh, solution in the, uh, a basis defines not only a primal solution, it also defines a dual solution according to, to this equation. The details are not so important. The important thing to note is if this is feasible, this uh, thing computed according to this equation, meaning if these inequalities are satisfied, then we're actually optimum. And uh, so what does Danzig's pivot rule do? Well, if we're already optimal, we're done. So if we're not optimal, then we actually have uh, 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 at least one component where these inequalities are not satisfied, namely that we have some component of the vector C minus ATY that's uh, positive, and we're just going to take the largest one. So we're being, in some sense, greedy. OK? In terms of what, how we leave, uh, if it's uh, non-degenerate, that's unique. But if it's not, then actually our results are robust to any rule you might pick for the leaving variable. OK, so here's some background. So I mean, I haven't told you what our results yet, but how did we even start thinking about this problem? Um, it was really due to uh, Deeser and Scatella's paper that's going to appear in Soda, but appeared on the archive uh, over a year ago. And what they did is they showed that if you, um, if you run the network simplex algorithm and you ask the question, what is the complexity of whether a particular variable enters the basis along the way? And they had various motivations for looking at that question. That problem is NP-hard. And they, called the, they uh, coined this phrase NP-mighty for then they called the algorithm itself NP-mighty, and they make an argument in their paper that it's a natural thing to classify the mightiness of algorithms by what they can implicitly compute. We're going to look at two things. We're going to look at what the simplex method can implicitly compute, but also explicitly compute in terms of what is the complexity of, say, a variable being in the basis of the actual solution computed by the simplex method with Danzig's pivot rule. So when I saw this paper, why I immediately thought um, that we could do further work on this is because the problem's clearly not, not clearly not in, but very unlikely to actually be in NP. It's very unlikely that you have a short witness that says to you, was this variable switched along the way uh, if you ran this algorithm, or is it in the final solution? And so I immediately thought that probably the right uh, complexity class here is P space, not NP. And in fact, we had some earlier work um, on a similar algorithm called the lemke hausen algorithm that Kusha mentioned, it was essentially the motivation for Papa Dimitri's class PPAD. It's a complementary pivoting algorithm that in some sense generalizes simplex. And we had earlier shown that computing any of the solutions it might find is p-space hard. But there we used very different techniques because there we had at hand this definition of PPAD that Kush had at the top of the slide but didn't go into details of. It's essentially you walk along these, uh, these graphs, these directed graphs with, uh, um, with paths and cycles. And uh, there's a natural problem there that's PPAD hard, uh, that's P-space hard as a starting point. Namely, if you're given this starting source, if you have to find the thing at the other end of this path, that's P-space hard. The actual PPAD problem is find me the thing at the end of the path or any other source or sink in the graph, which is PPAD, but actually finding the exact one at the other end of this path, that's P space hard. Okay, so anyway, um, we then worked on this problem. Exponential uh, lower bounds on the running time of these algorithms for simplex was known since the 70s, clear and minty. 
uh, showed it for Danzig's pivot rule. Essentially, most well-known pivot rules have, have, have corresponding lower bounds now. And it was already known for Lemke-Hausen even before this result. On the day we submitted uh, our paper to archive, actually, uh, Christos uh, emailed in response to an email from us saying, with this paper in attachment, saying this is in IPCO, and essentially you've solved uh, our main open problem in it, which was nice. When I saw the attachment, I thought, oh no, they've already, they've already proved this, but actually not. So what they did is, they're also de dealing with p-space hardness, but they get a result for an abstract pivot rule, essentially. Nothing from the literature. They came up, they constructed the pivot rule to show that it's possible to have uh, a p-space hard pivoting rule, essentially. OK, so our main results then are um, given a linear program, an initial basic feasible solution, and a variable, we look at two problems. Will that variable enter the basis along the way as we run Danzig's pivot rule? And will it be in the final optimal basis at the end of running Danzig's pivot rule? And we show that both of these are p-space complete. Any questions so far? OK, our approach, we're constructing Markov decision processes, which I'll give you a brief introduction to. Uh, and we show that for these Markov decision processes, a variant of a very natural algorithm called policy iteration, where we switch a single action, which is uh, some notion within an MDP, uh, corresponds exactly to Danzig's pivot rule applied to a corresponding LP. Then we show that this variant of policy iteration is capable of iterated circuit evaluation. Okay, so uh, I won't go into the details, but I just wanted to, and this maybe is one of the main messages here, if you want to prove stuff about M, uh, LPs, MDPs have been particularly useful in constructing, uh, for example, lower bounds in this stock best paper for uh, a random version of simplex for LPs, because the MDPs give you a lot of structure, and you'll see some of that in, in what follows. OK, so our corresponding results for MDPs are, given a Markov decision process, which I'll define shortly, a starting policy, which will be direct analog of a basis, and an action, which will be a direct analog of a, of a variable, um, does Danzig's switching rule for policy iteration ever switch an action, or will that action be in the final optimal policy? These two things are piece space hard. So um, once one's proved the relationship, here, essentially, everything else is done in the MDP world, and the results for the L LPs follow directly. OK, so the roadmap um, for the final uh, 10 or 12 minutes or so is to convince you of that equivalence for MDPs between policy iteration and Danzig's pivot rule for LPs, and then to just give a high-level overview of the construction. And the in their terminology, it's P-space mighty. There are various reasons why I'm not such a fan of their definition. I prefer to state concrete uh, uh, decision problems and say that those are P-space hard. Because uh, their thing depends on a Turing machine in a way that, I mean, I don't think is necessary. But yes, in their terminology, it's P-space mighty. But this second result is actually of independent interest. They only talk about implicit computation. This also tells you that actually you can read something off from the solution as well. OK. Um, fine. What's an MDP? For us, um, we're going to represent it as a directed graph with decision states that are going to be squares, actions that are the uh, arcs, and rewards that are the weights that you see on edges here. Okay, so in this example, all the rewards are zero except for one going from sync prime up to sync. I know it's not really a sync, it has this, uh, this loop on it, but other than that, this is a, a DAG actually, and we're going to use that, uh, we're going to see that as a running example. Okay, we also have um, uh, random transitions involved, and uh, for, the, for the examples you're going to see, they're going to be encoded as these circles, which in this example, we don't show the probabilities because these circles all have half-half. So just think these are half-half probabilities. M imagine moving around a token, and if you're here with probability half, you go up here. With probability half, you go here. Along the way, you collect the rewards of the corresponding arcs that you traverse. 
there are no rewards. Really, when you play an action, you imagine having a probability distribution, and so we've really split it into having these extra nodes just for expository purposes. Okay, so what's a deterministic policy? You could, in principle, have randomized policies. We don't need those. We are not, when we talk about a policy, it's always deterministic. It's just a choice of what you do at your decision nodes. In this particular example, you have no choices at uh, zero or SI prime or at SI. So really, the policies here are whether you go across or down at one, two, and three. Okay, so we're going to see that... Uh, and we're going to, in fact, see an exponential time policy iteration ex example that goes through all eight of the possible policies here. Okay, so we're going to look at total expected reward. Really, uh, what we're doing is uh, <coughs> we're actually working with average reward, uh, but uh, we are starting our policy iteration algorithm from a particular point that has the same average reward as the final solution. And um, this, uh, this happens to be zero. So this actually gives a massive simplification. We can do everything in terms of total expected reward. But uh, actually, policy iteration is still kosher and will work. Uh, but um, that's a technicality. But it does work. So total expected reward um, just means we're interested in maximizing the sum of all the things that we get along the way. Uh, in this example, we're eventually going to get zero, so we know that the average reward is, uh, 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 is, is actually going to be zero. Um, but we're interested in total reward, so essentially, in this example, we're interested in picking up this eight somehow. Okay, so we're going to define the value of a node under, of a state under a deterministic policy as the reward you get... Um, by following the policy and the expectation over the values you get at the state you would end up at next, according to the policy. Okay then, so here we can start filling this in. Here we're going to use the DAG structure to just fill it in from right to left. So we can fill in that here we get zero because we have to go to the sink. We don't get any rewards. Here we get zero as well. Here we get zero as well. But under this policy, here, um, so here we'd actually have picked up four uh, because with probability half we go along the bottom and get uh, half of this eight. And uh, with probability half we get the zero. And so filling back, we're going to get four, two, one. And here by going down, we actually get one by picking up the value that we get uh, beneath. Okay. Essentially, once you have, uh, okay, so um, you should think of once you have a policy as being able to compute these values as solving a system of linear equations. Okay, so what about uh, a characterization of optimal uh, policies? Well, for us, it's going to simply be that we, um, we uh, need a solution to the following value equations that look very similar to these ones before except now we have a max in there where we max, where, where we're, um, instead of looking at this fixed policy, we're allowing ourselves to choose over the possible actions available at that state, and we want to uh, have uh, values that ensure that uh, we're getting the maximum over the possible actions of the reward we get by following that action and the expected uh, reward uh, the the expected value we get uh, given the probabilistic transitions. Okay, so I probably wanted to, I'm not sure if I wanted to say more there, but I'm running out of time anyway. So, uh, so we need one more thing to be able to define policy iteration, and that's the uh, idea of appeal. It's going to be directly analogous to, um, to these violated constraints in the dual LP that we saw earlier. The basic idea is um, we can see if we have a value zero here that we're not optimal because um, uh, we, could, uh, we could get a better value by switching what we do currently, which is going right to going down and picking up this value four. The appeal simply says if we compare under this policy what we get, what the value we get under this policy compared with what we would get by making a essentially local deviation to a different action, picking up the associated reward, and then getting the expectation according to those original values. 
So, I mean, we're not re-solving re the linear system, we're just checking what we would get uh, by doing a different action and then using the values that we already know for the given policy. And we're optimal if and only if we cannot uh, actually uh, improve that way, uh, in, that, in that local way, namely if all these uh, appeals are non-positive. Here, actually, um, we could improve by switching this guy down because we would get, instead of this zero, we'd get four, and here, instead of this zero, we'd get two, so there are multiple choices of actually where uh, we have positive appeal. Those are the appeals of... Uh, of switches at all three places. So if we switched here, we'd get four, we'd go from zero to four, here zero to two, and here we're actually already happy uh, because we're getting one by going down, and if we switched across, we'd actually do worse, we'd get zero. Okay, so, um, so an action is switchable under a given policy Okay, so we, can, we, we compute the values according to the policy. We can then essentially read off the appeals. And an action is switchable uh, if and only if the appeal of that action is strictly positive. Generic policy iteration then says, while you've got some switchable actions, just switch any non-empty subset of them. And you can prove that that will actually improve um, your values. And in the end, this will terminate with an optimal policy. You have a finite number of policies, but we're not, I mean, you could improve any non-empty subset. We're going to specifically look at single switches, switching a single action. Yes, yeah, sorry. So depending on which subset you choose to switch, do you reach different points eventually, or do you always get to the same point? I mean, you'll always get the same values at the end, but you could, in principle, reach different, different points, policies. yes, different policies, yeah. Okay, so what's Danzig's switching rule is pitch the... Pitch pick the single action that has the highest appeal. Okay? Fine. So, um, in this case, that would be switching this guy. And uh, you can see what happens when we do. Uh, we're, we're still not actually optimal. I'm not going to go through that. I'm running out of time. This, uh, this is the unique optimal policy. And if you stare at it for a minute, it makes a lot of sense that at the rightmost guy, you would want to jump down and uh, get this half of eight, and along the top two, you would want to actually just go straight along and, um, and actually uh, grab uh, the same value. Uh, block pivoting, it's not really simplex. It's not necessarily a well-defined algorithm for general LPs. But there is, um, there is uh, for policy iteration, also a very other natural... Um, so greedy actually means something different for policy iteration. The greedy version of policy iteration would be switch everything that has positive appeal. And that also has some recent lower bounds that started a bunch of these connections to MDPs and other work, essentially. So you could switch everything, or you could switch just one thing. We're just switching a single thing, the thing with the highest appeal. Okay, so um, I guess... I'm running out of time, so all I want you to notice from this LP... <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so um, all I want you to notice from this LP is the correspondence between these inequalities and the appeal condition, essentially, the definition of appeal. Okay, so here we're comparing... So we have uh, one of these inequalities uh, for uh, state action pairs... And we are comparing the value you get with the reward uh, and the uh, expected values uh, according to uh, the action you choose. And essentially, it's the usual trick of taking a max and implementing it within a linear program, just like you do, say, with a zero-sum by matrix game or something. Exactly the same type of trick here. We just have inequalities here uh, instead of the max, and we minimize uh, these variables here in the objective function. We could actually take, I mean, to get a solution at every node in the MDP, we could actually take any uh, um, combination of all of these such that it's positive on every state. We're taking a uniform one, um, which actually uh, just implies that when we take the dual, that actually these variables in the dual is the expected number of times the action will be used 
starting from a uniformly random, uh, uniform at randomly chosen state. But you could have any distribution there. Okay, we take the we take the jewel of this thing, and we're going to run simplex on this. But really, you shouldn't stare at this too much because all that's relevant is in its jewel. This, these are the inequalities that are going to correspond to Danzig's pivot rule and the most violated, you know, the reduced costs that we defined earlier. And I guess I have that as the next slide. Exactly. So this is the jewel where we're doing all pivoting according to these conditions, which are exactly the appeals. And so from now on, we're going to talk about appeals only. Uh, and uh, I've sketched out a, an equivalence between policy iteration and Danzig's pivot rule applied to that dual LP. Okay, so, um, so now we're going to do the construction. We need, um, oh no, before I talk about appeal reduction, I'm just going to tell you what we're going to reduce from. So uh, imagine you're given a Boolean circuit, uh, taking as input an n, uh, n bits and giving n bits as output. <laughs> we're given a bit string. Uh, an, uh, uh, with n bits, and we're given a particular bit, and we're going to consider two problems: uh, is the uh, is the zth uh, is the zth bit of uh, this uh, function uh, that's encoded by the circuit iterated two to the n times? So what do I mean? I mean we we run it on b, we get some output, we run it on the output, and so on. Is the zth bit equal to 1? That's going to correspond to is a variable in our final solution. And is the zth bit equal to 1 for some even i along the way? The only reason for the even i along the way is because we're going to have pairs of circuits in our construction. It's just a technical detail. That's going to correspond to, given that we start with that zth bit as being 0, uh, otherwise the problem is trivial, that's going to correspond, flipping the bit is going to correspond to um, uh, 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 bring in action into the policy as we run policy iteration. Okay, so hopefully it's fairly clear that these are p space hard problems because f can simulate one iteration of a space bounded Turing machine, so iterating it corresponds to actually running the space bounded Turing <coughs> machine, and when we finished, we actually have the final configuration of this thing. Okay, so here's the basic setup we're going to have a pair of circuits. And um, the whole thing is going to be driven by a clock. The clock is actually basically the example I've been showing you, and I'm going to explain that in slightly more detail in a sec. The basic idea is going to be that we have uh, even and odd iterations, and um, one is going to compute and the other is going to copy uh, in these, these different phases. Okay, so before I can just show you the clock uh, and, and, what, and what the important properties of it are, the first thing to note is actually uh, the optimal strategy had this guy pointing down. Uh, and actually, we do want to start from uh, uh, pointing right everywhere. The problem is if we just switch the thing with highest appeal in this construction as it is, we'd be there in one step. What we're going to do is use an appeal reduction gadget which essentially will turn the, policy the run of policy iteration into following a gray code, just like a clean minty cube, which you may have come across from the simplex method already. Uh, and so we, I'll, I'll explain you a simplified version of appeal reduction gadget. Um, just to give you the basic idea, it's really simple. You, uh, you want ap appeal reduction for the action that takes you from S to T. You shove a random node in between, and we're going to control the appeal reduction with the probabilities on the outgoing edges from this random node. And essentially, consider the case you have some alternative place you could go, and consider the, the case where you're actually using ST in the current policy. Then, no matter what these probabilities are, you don't actually change the value because you're actually going right anyway, so it doesn't matter that with some probability you come back here, you're still going to end up there with full probability. On the other hand, and this is a property of appeal, the greediness of appeal, if you're actually currently going down, then um, by setting this probability P very low, actually the appeal can be made arbitrarily low, whatever the reward was, because you make this probability of coming back here very high. Okay, so this is the basic trick that allows you to control things in a very precise way all over the construction. 
Okay, so the, um, if you don't know what a gray code is, it's a nice uh, it's a nice construction that recursively allows that can be done recursively that allows you to go through all bit strings uh, by flipping only one bit at a time. So just to give you the rough idea, you, you start with zero one, you now write them backwards one zero, zeros are on the end, ones on the end, and now you repeat. So we're now going to flip this whole thing the other way, and um, essentially these already featured as the underlying. Uh, combinatorial sequence uh, for Klee Minty's cubes and also for Condon Melekopoglu's uh, worst case examples uh, on which our clock are actually based. We have some differences, but um, ultimately they, they are, the ideas were already in that paper from 94 for the clock. Okay, so anyway, um, we have a peel reduction, that's what these alphas uh, signify. We need to set those all correctly, and if you do, you will end up always switching the leftmost, uh, the leftmost action that's switchable, and you end up with following this gray code. The important thing to note, actually, and this is what's going to drive the whole construction, is that we have these values on these two end nodes that we've plugged in at the end. Everything in, the cir everything in our um, implementation of the circuits is going to plug into the clock, and they're going to see these two nodes that essentially in each step of the clock, in each tick of the clock, are going to be, have the same difference between them, but it's going to swap which one's higher. Okay? So this one's higher, then that one's higher. The difference is the same, and we use those differences to drive all the switches that happens within the construction. So essentially at time t, even circuit 1 has a high value at C1. It's going to be in a compute phase. The other one's going to be storing, and then this is going to switch whenever the clock ticks. Okay, and, and um, things in the clock only change when everything below has actually happened because of, of the re appeal rule, essentially. We have control over when everything happens. Okay, so um, just to kind of uh, finish things off, I'm just going to flash up some gadgets without explaining how they work. But essentially, inside one of the circuits, we have our... We're going to deal with uh, these F influences Boolean circuits by just um, not and OR gates. We need some padding just to make sure that the inputs of uh, an OR gate are from the same level, which gives us, uh, which gives us some uh, further structure that we exploit. That's trivial because you just shove in dummy OR gates. And now I just flash up the gadgets. We have a slightly more complicated appeal reduction gadget, and we simply implement an input bit, an OR gate, a NOT gate. Uh, and actually the complicated part is... Um, is how these things feed into, the outputs feed into the other uh, circuit and vice versa, and you need to get the transitions right when the, th the main difficulty is when uh, the phase changes from computing to uh, storing. Okay, and so these are our results again. I mean, we're asking, is an action ever switched along the way? Is it used in the final output? We start with the base construction for this first question, is it ever switched? And I'll, I'll show you a bit on that. And then we add one extra gadget for this second question. So for this first question, do we ever switch an action along the way? Essentially, we look within an input bit, and we look at what, the, uh, what a particular node within that input bit actually does. So this is the... This is the uh, this is the output that either goes right or left, and literally we have two nodes that encode whether this bit is zero or one, and essentially we start with the thing pointing one way, and if it ever points the other way, then it's gonna directly correspond to that bit flip in the iteration of the circuit. We need one other gadget, so I'm going a bit quickly now, but um, give the main idea. We have one other gadget that basically says, when the clock's ticked, we left the ticks as two to the end. In principle, you could stop it earlier if you wanted, uh, whenever. But I mean, that's kind of neither here nor there because you're never going to use this thing for anything practical. But I mean, you don't need to finish all two to the end ticks of this clock necessarily, but we just allow our construction to run. And when you finish those two to the end ticks, what we do is we essentially have a little gadget that forces. Uh, the bit in question to become indifferent between 1 and 0. So it's pointing in some particular direction that encodes, um, that encodes the value of uh, f of b iterated 2 to the n times. And by making it indifferent, uh, we know that it will never switch 
the appeal will be uh, zero uh, uh, forevermore. Uh, and and, um, and the, the key point here is, you might wonder how are you actually, we know that linear programming is in P, so how are you actually getting a, a P-space hardness result related to the solution? The point here is you can have uh, many different solutions, same value, but many different optimal solutions, and this gadget actually makes that very explicit, namely it introduces an indifference between two actions. And so you could have the action point the other way and it would still be a solution, uh, but we lock that in. Okay, so to reiterate, we have results for MDPs and LPs, where the MDP corresponds to the LP, a starting policy corresponds to an initial basic feasible solution, an action corresponds to a variable. We consider two problems, is an action ever switched, is an action used in the final optimal policy, Similarly for the LP, uh, Adler, uh, Adler, Papa Dimitri Rubinstein considered one other problem that I want to make a quick comment on, which was they consider an actual basis and they asked, does this feature along the way? So we asked, is a, is a variable ever switched along the way? They, they asked, is an actual vertex featuring on the path? And one interesting thing about that is for the shadow vertex simplex method, actually that problem is solvable in polynomial time. And that's intimately related to things like the polynomial smoothed complexity in a way. That structure gives you a way to analyze these algorithms, which we don't have for other pivot rules. Um, and so um, one can ask, I mean, um, so one can ask really what's, what, what's the point in all this? Well, really, one of the biggest open problems in linear programs is there a strong, strongly polynomial time pivoting algorithm. So I claim it's interesting to actually understand what pivoting rules can actually do, what, what restrictions on them do we need to actually get polynomiality. And, um, and in particular, if you had some insights that gave you a recipe for p-space hardness, we're a long way from that at the moment, but if you did, that, would, uh, that could potentially shed light on that question. Um, of course, the ultimate goal would be construct a polynomial time pivot rule, but I mean, this, uh, this is a long way from that. And finally, um, what is the computational power of other algorithms? I mean, can we, can we see, I mean, in some sense, what's happening here is the simplex is computing something much more complicated than we're actually interested in as a problem, and maybe that happens in other cases as well. Okay, thank you very much.